We'll ratify that in a moment. For everyone, it is, starts off with public comment and then moves on into the presentation. Uh, if I could have a motion to accept the agenda as printed, or second? second. I have a motion second to accept the agenda as presented. I'm going to call the roll. Dave? Yes. Tiffany? Yes. Poppins? Yes. Thank you. Technicalities that we have to go through, folks. So if there is anybody in the audience, we do send out 30 minutes uh, for public uh, comment in front of all of our meetings. If there's anybody who would like up to come up and approach and present or ask uh, or any topic about the county, this would be the time and place for that. If you do come up, please give your name and address for the record. Thank you. My name is Betty Otten, 46787 273rd Street T, South Dakota. Um, well, uh, no one will explain why the, quest uh, the question on why T was chosen over Canton for this jail. Please explain. Number two, why aren't or why weren't the residents of T notified, especially those with properties surrounding the proposed jail? Number three, Chairman Poppins, last week, 10 6, during the design presentation for the jail, Neither Commissioner Landine nor Mr. Gulov seemed to know that there were no utilities available on the 154 acres of wetlands that you just purchased to vote on three to two. You interrupted to clarify in conversations with the city they're planning on movement of utilities onto that area within two years. That's conversation with their city manager. Well, when did those conversations with the city manager happen? What was discussed? Were they public discussions? and who was involved with those conversations. And then number four, in last week's Argus Leader article, Commission Chair Poppin said that the county pays for inmates to be transported to nine different county jails among three states, and at that time to build a jail is now. Well, we'd like to know what nine county jails in which three states and the time frame. We'd also like to know how many actual inmates we pay or paid for every month to Minnehaha County. Neither of these two stats above are found anywhere on the Lincoln County website. Only numbers from 2014, 16, and 18 embedded in a document. Would you publicly post those numbers? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the audience that would like to approach the board? My name is Douglas Putnam from T, South Dakota, and I was wondering about uh, all of the properties that the county owns, like the courthouse in Canton. Uh, is it paid for yet? Is the county shed, the truck shop, is that paid for yet? And is this building here paid for yet? And is there any other properties that aren't paid for yet? And then what are our taxes, go, how much are they going up on this proposed deal per 100,000? I, I believe a lot of those answers will come through the presentation. So uh, hopefully the comments that your questions you have will be answered with that. Otherwise, there are postcards I did want to mention that if someone does have a question that did not get answered, please uh, fill out the questions on there so we can get back to those. If you would leave your email on there, that would help us immensely, so thank you. So what you're saying is you're not gonna elaborate on that, that's just the questions I asked. Uh, uh, this is a point of public uh, comment. Uh, it's not a question and answer period, unfortunately. I do believe a lot of your questions will come in the uh, point of the presentation. Okay. And you still have an opportunity after the presentation to ask the commissioners. 
Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Colin McClure, 27289 Sequoia Avenue, T, South Dakota. Uh, just a couple of points that I would like to make. Uh, I've noticed through the outline that was uh, presented on the chairs that uh, February 18th of this year, there was a motion passed uh, to have a, uh, four public meetings regarding this. Then the month later, uh, those were postponed and then followed up in July. Uh, another motion to make it expedient and just begin moving forward. Uh, whether that had to do with the, the pandemic and COVID, probably. However, it seems a bit disingenuous to most of us uh, that it will just move forward without additional comment and input from those of us, especially who live directly within the zone of impact where this facility is proposed to be built. Additionally, I've noticed that there will be a significant amount of fill that's taken out of the area that's proposed. Uh, if the information is available, I haven't been able to find it yet as to how that is going to affect the drainage uh, of those of us who live there uh, and downstream from where the water is going to flow. Uh, it would be irresponsible for this commission to present this for a vote without having a comprehensive study, engineering studies, as I understand it, that's an ongoing process for the entire area uh, that has been put off and delayed. So if those studies haven't been done yet, I don't think any of us can make a good informed decision whether we should vote yes or no what the future outcome is going to be. Uh, not to mention uh, just the impact of having this facility near our neighborhoods where our kids play, where we live and where we work every day. So if throughout the presentation, if that information is available, I would appreciate it. If it's not, I would encourage you to do your due diligence and make sure that those studies are done before a final decision is made on this. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? I'm going to recognize a young lady here, if you won't mind. Thank you. Hi, my name is Linda Simmons Mutt, and I live at 47004 Rose Circle. Oh. Um, just help me understand, with the pandemic going on and people unemployed and businesses closing, is now the time to have a jail, new jail built. And how and why did you buy the land without the approval of the jail? And how did you do it without zoning and letting the people in the area know what was going to come? I heard that there was an $8 million floor that could have been bought in Sioux Falls at that jail. Why not that? Why here? Why not the land that you had south of Canton? Why not build it there? And what's the plan for the old courthouse? We're just going to destroy that? Um, one last thing, um, the $42,000 filing fee for the architect and the contractor, why an out-of-state company? And why have that before you even know that you're going to get the jail? There's so much going on in the United States right now. Is this the time to spend taxpayers' money? That's all I have to ask. Thank you. Um, the gentleman? This is uh, Chris Berg, 340 North Ceylon Avenue, T, South Dakota. And my question is, is what led you to select the site by T for the Public Safety Center, and why is it located close to residential neighborhoods where you have families and kids? My concern there would be more with the families around that jail, and then the devaluation of the property that is around the jail. And then if the bond were to be passed, what would be done to mitigate the negative effects of the jail near the residential areas? Or could it be located somewhere else? Thank you. Anybody else? 
Come on up. I, it, it, our agenda is printed, but we're always available for questions. I mean, as a board afterwards. I, I can't answer that for the board. I, if there's a specific question now, it may be able to be addressed by the presentation. My name is Mike Schmidt. I live at 27236 Canary Court T. I went and looked at the site where this is gonna go and there is a large quantity of what looks like floodplain area, is that correct? Okay, yes. Yes. so we have land where we're gonna to have to fill. Somebody addressed it earlier about drainage. Uh, we are, I was at the one last month where there was a number of people talking about drainage throughout the county. So has this been factored in yet, yes or no? Has drainage been factored in, yes or no? Board, does anybody want to take that question? We're going to do this presentation. It will be open. I am going to stick around for questions specific like this if they're not been answered. Uh, the board is not answering at this point in time, but uh, I'm going to stick around and I'm glad to answer that personally, but not as the... Will it be official answers or will it be just one-on-one -on -one type thing? Well, I can't speak for the whole board. I can speak for myself. So if I speak So here, it won't be official. What is the official? Yeah. Sir? In this, in this forum. I, this is the forum that we have. Okay. By our ordinance is we accept presentation of comments. Okay. Uh, the it, next question I have is, um, I heard a rumor, and so I just wanted to ask you guys. I was told that one or more of the board members have money invested in the land that was bought and then sold back to the county. Is this true, yes or no? I would ask that you go to the person that has been suspected of having that and act it, ask that one personally. I think that's a personal question. Yes or no, does any member on this board have money invested in this project? I do not. I do not. Okay. Oh, nor have, ever have. Not to my knowledge, sir. Okay. Uh, my last question is, with regard to the location, uh, it's a mile and a half from my daughter's school, and right next to the, everyone's concern here is you're going to put a jail cell right in the middle of a neighborhood, a mile away from town, and I, was, I heard from another source that you plan on renting out uh, jail cells to federal inmates. Is this correct? We believe that answer will be in the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else would like to ask a question or a comment? It's just for comment, yes. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Wheeler, 47022 Terry Lane T. Um, Maybe just a comment and question here. I know on the meeting on August 25th, you guys tabled the decision to purchase the land and then immediately voted to purchase it because they were going to sell it or do something else with it. Mr. Lemmy wasn't going to hold it for you guys forever. But there was some discussion there about him wanting money for the dirt, I thought, that was on this lot as well. And so we're not making that public knowledge right now. And I believe he was saying the tune of five or seven dollars a ton in which there was like another million dollars worth of dirt there that's not being brought up. Uh, there's a four-way intersection that needs to be built and paved there to the tune of how knows how many millions, plus about three miles of road. So I uh, just want some clarification on who's covering all of that. So that's all. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we've got some people there in the back before this gentleman gets up here. We've got some seats up here if you people would like to come forward and sit down. My name's Steve Wickard. I'm the mayor for the town of Hudson. One of my concerns is how fast this got pushed through. There were supposed to be some public meetings that got canceled because of COVID. Not sure why we couldn't have waited until the public meetings could have occurred to proceed with this deal. My other concern was 
I hear a lot of talk of this facility being in the north part of the county. So it's convenient to the people in the north part of the county. What about the ones in the south part? Is this just a preemptive strike to get the courthouse, everything up here? What about us in the south? We're still there. Right now it takes an hour for me to get a deputy down into Hudson. And I'm 20 minutes away. What's going to happen if this gets moved up here? That's one of my major concerns. Not to mention, it shouldn't be right inside of city limits of T. That's just wrong. Thank you. If I could. Thank you, everyone. Um, is there the next person who would like to come up? Tony Becker, uh, 46677 Canary Place, T, South Dakota. Spoke to you guys, I think, at the last meeting when you guys were approving the land purchase. I guess some questions I had uh, and comments um, from not only a contractor side of things, but City of T has a lot of contractors. So I guess my concern is that when I look at a building like this being built in a contractor town, how much public input are we gonna have on design elements, value engineering, things like that, coming forward if the project is approved? Or are we not gonna have any say as to any of those details by an out-of-state contractor that necessarily doesn't, the architecture firm, doesn't understand maybe what we see locally in the construction industry that saves money, costs to build structures within these city properties and around our area? Um, on top of that, then, I guess I also like to piggyback on the fact that during that same meeting that the land was purchased, there was no five-year plan as to how the roads were going to get paved um, in that area. Uh, is it about the city of T that has to, taxpayers have got to pay for that? Same thing as all the infrastructures, all that stuff. Outside that property, there's no drainage. Um, it was mentioned, I believe, in the meeting that the road or something was going to get brought up 20 feet. But yet there's no maintenance for it. There's no plan. That's city of T property. The gravel road south of there is not planned to get paved in the next five years on the comprehensive plan that was submitted during that meeting. And then on top of that, I'd also like to ask, you know, sheriffs, how many arrests, how many inmates are processed because of Sioux Falls police in Lincoln County? And is that going to be a burden on the city of Sioux Falls police station to drive out of jurisdiction to go and process an inmate at our facility in Lincoln County? And then are they going to have the computer rights to process paperwork or all that? Is that going to be a problem? I, I haven't been asked that, found that any information out. I guess I got a family of police officers. That's the one thing they asked me. Says, well, where are they going to have to go? Can they process it out of their vehicle? How's that all going to work? You're adding a lot of scope here that I think is just, where is it coming from? I'd like to know. I'm sure workers would like to know. Same thing as people that live in the, work in this jail cell and things like that. I mean, what are the benefits? Thank you. Uh, we have some time yet. Is there anybody else that would like to come up? Thank you. Alan Rip and Drop, 46963, 272nd Street, T. I got a, just a question, maybe I don't know the formality here, but from my understanding, everybody asks the good questions, but we're not going to get any answers to any of these now? I can refer back to what our ordinance or resolution was passed about how these get addressed. It's for public to make comments versus a question and answer. I, I, I'm not going to try to say that's right or wrong, it's just that's unfortunately the way it is. So uh, the commission, if they choose to, they can, uh, but it is by, by our resolution that's the way this is set up. Mm -hmm. Then what's the purpose of this meeting other than to see what it would look like if, if it goes through? Well, hopefully some of the, I do believe a lot of the questions that have been answered will be answered by the presentation, but you're more than welcome to, again, to stick around and or leave messages or contact us personally. 
um, but at this point, it's, it's meant for people to make comments. Mm. Well, it just let, it's just that it seems like there's a lot of good questions. And that, no one disagrees with that. That there's not any answers coming out on that. Well, I, a lot of it will have to do with time constraints, so this is meant for public comment at this point, but it seems technical, but thank you, Mr. Robinson. To, to that point, I would encourage you to talk to your commissioners to say change the resolution as it sits, but thank you. Uh, Kevin Wheeler, T again, sorry, I forgot one other, uh, I didn't see it on the agenda, this might be a question you can answer, but are you gonna cover engineering or site plan engineering as far as soil condition and stuff tonight in this presentation, because it is a slew. So anything as far as, have we done any engineering work for footings and things like that, or are we building the moat around it, or will that be covered? <laughs> I think it's the moat is the answer. The moat? Yes. Moats and boats, all right. Moats and boats. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? If there's no one else, I'm going to allow the presentations to kind of get started here, folks. I do want to thank you for coming and allowing this presentation of what is being presented to you as taxpayers and residents of Lincoln County. Uh, this has been an ongoing um, conversation for many years uh, between this commission and previous commissions about what to do with our prisoners. Uh, currently, we house um, our uh, prisoners in uh, Minneapolis County, as opposed to what many, uh, the Argus leader quoted. Uh, that was a misquote um, to get that answered. Uh, that was a previous situation in which Minneapolis County did not have space for us and we had to scramble. Um, hopefully that clarifies that statement. What we'll hopefully be able to see in front of us are uh, cost projections, appearance projections, uh, ideas, um, what this impact will be tax-wise. Ultimately, this is your decision, um, and we will abide as commission uh, with the vote and, and move on. Um, the things that I want to stress is this is not something that's going away. We're a very proud county. We have uh, been growing rapidly. I think we have a bright future in front of us. The, um, the unfortunate part of growth is some of the side effects that comes. And that has to do with the sheer number of uh, prisoners that we are seeing it, um, consistently grow. Now, COVID has affected all parts of our lives, including the number of detainees that we have in jail. The system has tried to minimize that to as much as possible. Um, to prevent spread inside their facilities, as well as try to keep the public safe. Uh, it's, a, it's a tenuous ba a balance, um, but I think they're doing a good job with it. When we do get out of COVID, and we will at some point in time, and the court systems get up and running, um, things will change, and um, we need to be prepared for it. Um, right now, we have four years left. It takes time if we ever do decide to build. Uh, to get it planned and get it up and running. Um, to wait until this contract is up, is, that's going to be a, a situation that I hope that we, whoever is sitting in these seats don't have to face. Um, so I encourage you to be uh, uh, open-minded as to what, what we truly are facing, because we are in this together. I've lived here for 54 years. I've seen some marvelous things. I've been a victim of of theft four times in two years um, in, in three different farms that I have. It's not going away, folks. As much as we want to say, hey, there's, there's going to be a silver lining to it, it's not. And we have to have a solution. And if that solution is to continue to house them in some other county, that's great. Let's have a long-term plan. Uh, the plan that we had was a five-year scenario. To me, that's not a long-term plan when you're talking about incarceration. That, that flies by. So we need, need to figure out something for the future. Um, and this is a good, good option. Is it the best option? We'll see if the taxpayers think so or not. Uh, but it is an option. It gives you the opportunity at the end of the, the bond to have a facility and control your destiny. Um, we're going to start off, I believe, with Sheriff Swenson who want to run through the logistics of... Mr. Uh, Chairman, I have a motion to make. Very I, good. I want to move that we allow question and answer period 
as part of our formal meeting after the presentation is over. I'm going to uh, point of order. It's not on our agenda. And public comment is on the agenda, and that includes the ability to control, decide, determine, and fashion what public comment will look like. We talked about this at this morning's meeting. You knew it was coming, everybody did. I even said I wanted public question and answer period. I don't know why you're fighting it. You fought I it this morning and you're fighting it again. No, I am not fighting. I have said officially I'm sticking around for questions. There is no microphone gonna be off, Commissioner Aarons. If the public wants to speak, I'm not going to stop it. I don't believe we have to have a motion to uh, that it. That's why we're having the presentation, folks. Is it on our agenda, Commissioner Aaron's, for a motion? Yes. And, and clarify on our agenda how that is. It's a technicality, thank you, but clarify it, versus us just saying here and answering questions. Because it, otherwise it's grandstanding on your part. I'm not leaving here, folks. Mr. Chairman, there's no need to call names. I don't think that's calling names. You are calling me a grandstander. Stay away from personal attacks. I, I encourage you to do the same. All I've asked for is public comment, period. And we're having public comment. I've asked for a question and answer period as well. And now See, you're folks, arguing. this is where the problem comes in. I've said I'm going to stay. I am staying. I will gladly answer any questions. I can't, by dictate to my other commissioners, what they do or don't do. He could have changed this agenda so we could have had that conversation. No. It was not published as such. Absolutely, and that's why I've said I'm staying to answer any questions that are not, but I cannot dictate to my counterparts what I'm going to stop this, folks. I have a motion. I believe it's out of order. Is there a second to the motion? Mr. Chairman, I'll second that. Uh, I just want to add a little bit to that. Uh, Tony, you got up and spoke. Alan, you spoke. I know a lot of you. Steve, I could answer some of those questions. But our criteria, we were trying to keep it moving along. I can answer some of those questions. It's just that. Uh, you know, we thought, well, we'll wait till the end of the meeting. And I think, Mr. Chairman, uh, I could, I've got criteria in front of me right now where I can answer some of them. Uh, hopefully it's not too off base, but I, I've been on for almost 12 years on the commission, and uh, I, I got a fairly good background of it, so, uh, plus years in the sheriff's office. So, anyway, I'll second that. We have a motion and a second, but I am going to Go to council. Folks, this is unfortunately part of government as well. Is this on our agenda and can be discussed? Claire, just, it allow us to make a decision. I, can't, I cannot believe that we're having to have this, folks, because I've offered to stay. But we're gonna take your time and the presenter, presenter's time to answer this question. This is noticed as an informational meeting. 
we're going to, just for the record, call this question. I believe the, the answer will be not clear, but uh, Commissioner Gillespie, what is your thoughts on changing the agenda so that there is a specific uh, criteria for, is that your motion that there's a specific time that they can answer question, or ask questions, Commissioner Aarons? Just for clarification. Yes, there will be a question and answer period after the presentations are done, and it'll be a part of the formal official meeting. All right, Commissioner Gillespie. Yes, I support that. Uh, uh, we don't want people coming and driving here and then wasting their time tonight. We want to satisfy them as far as questions. They, they've spent time and gas and money to get here, so that's where I'm at. Commissioner Aarons. Yes. Commissioner Landine. I'm going to vote no, and the only reason I'm voting no really is because we've got three presenters here who I think are more than capable of answering everything that you folks brought up in public comment tonight. So I don't see the need. Now, there may be some follow-up questions. You've all been given cards. My suggestion and the reason you were given cards was to throw your email address on those cards, put your question on those cards, put your email on the card just if you want to be on the list. We can go through them, we can summarize the answers, and email it out to everybody so everybody has the same answer. And that's just in the way of efficiency, so we're not here until four in the morning. I want everybody's questions to be answered. I know that Commissioner Poppins, Commissioner Aarons, Commissioner Gillespie, we all want everybody's questions answered. There's no doubt about that. But this isn't the, I shouldn't say this isn't the time and place. We're just trying to get this out, get the information out, the presenters are going to address the vast majority of the things that you have brought up during public comment. So I'm voting no at this point. I too will be voting no, so it does not pass. But on the record, I am sticking around and will answer any questions uh, with an appropriate amount of time. We do need to get going uh, so these present uh, presenters can get through their uh, information. Hopefully that answers all the questions or as many as possible. Sheriff Swenson, would you like to get us started? Thank you all. Yeah. Okay, I put a, together a slideshow and, and updated a little bit on information that I was requested when I first took office to provide the county commission on our inmate situation in Lincoln County. So I'm gonna go through this. Um, one of the slides that's not on there, a question was asked. The current counties that we have contracts with are Minnehaha County, Noble, Sioux, Charles Mix, Pipestone, Lyon, Union, Clay, and Yankton. Over the last, since October of last year, Minnehaha County's uh, expansion has opened it partially opened back then and now it's fully open today. So we have 53 inmates in there today that Lincoln County is paying for, 67 total inmates, and that number will drop to 38 some days and be up to 65 some days. So it, it really varies depending on what's going on. So these numbers are all averages and most of this work was done by Garnos who does jail studies and has been doing jail studies for Lincoln County for several years along with Minneapolis County uses them, and I, they're out of Missouri. So this is where I've gotten most of my information. Now if I can get the slideshow to work. It's not, okay, there we go. Is it clicking? All right. Prisoner day increases, this is from 2014 to 2019, and these are summary numbers. The initial presentation I put on back prior to COVID, uh, I had some percentages in here that the math was wrong, so those have been fixed. So from 2014 to 2019, our prisoner day increased by 121%. That's from 7,544 days that we paid for. So if there's 50 inmates today, 
and 55 minutes a day. It's just the total of uh, basically rooms we rented for the year. So, so 2019 was 16,668. Uh, the felony filings in the state's attorney's office have increased from 2013 to 2018 by 145%. The annual income or annual cost increase of 102% is in 2014. We spent 569,000, and last year we spent 1.150. Now these numbers do not include tr include transport or manpower. That it's just what we paid in rent. Annual booking increased from 1481 to 2214, and that's the number of people that were booked into our system, and I'll show you the breakdown of that. This thing's not very, doesn't work. Right, and this is just what they're trying to do to keep people out of jail. The 24-7 program, we currently have about 130 to 150 participants in that. That is the, they blow in the morning, they blow in the afternoon into a PBT, or they're put on a scram bracelet that monitors alcohol in the system. And then electronic monitoring is different. That's the people that are sentenced to jail, uh, but are allowed to be on electronic monitoring to stay at work, uh, go home, and we GPS monitor them. Uh, today, this, this number was back from, from last year. We have 24 people on the program now, and we have 10 waiting for bracelets to be put into the system. Okay, the financial impact. Uh, over the last three years, 2017 to 2019, our average daily per diem, that's what we pay per inmate per day, was 68.47. Now that ranged from the 97.34 we pay in Minneapolis County to the $55 we paid in Nobles County, for instance. So we were moving these the inmates to these other other facilities because Minneapolis County was when the the uh, work release center burned, they ran out of space, and then we had to find these other facilities. And and I didn't actually. Dennis Johnson had set that up prior to me arriving there. Um, so today, 53 inmates times 97.34 is, is what we're paying today, but the average is $4,903 a day. Um, I did change these projections with the new Garnos information. Somebody asked me for a 30-year number, so I reached back out to Garnos, and the next slide will show that. But in 2023, we're projected to pay 2.33 million, and then in 2036, 5.7 million annually. And here's that slide, and I can't read it on here. So it's projected in 30 years it will pay, I want to say it says 182 million, if we do nothing but rent. Now, one of the, the misconceptions are that we were offered to build a, a floor in Minneapolis County. That is not true. And, and my understanding, talking to Sheriff Milstead, is it's not even legal, because we cannot bond for a project out of our county. Now, that's just the information I've been, been given on that because that question has been come up. We were not offered a floor for any amount of money. It was discussed, but not a possibility is, is the way I understand it. So the, the, the issue isn't going to be in five years. And honestly, I don't think it's going to be in 10 years where we're going to be in, where Lincoln County is going to be in trouble. In when Minneapolis County fills up, and they will, they're either going to have to add on or we're gonna to have to find some place else to go. And Yankton County is full, uh, Clay County is full. Uh, we can no longer house inmates out of state. So those, those four or five jails are gone. <clears throat> so th those are the problems that are, we're gonna hit in the future. Are we gonna be okay for the next five years? Absolutely, but at what cost? And that's what this number here shows is, and I can't see the projected numbers because it's too small. Hopefully you can see them on there. Okay. Now, the, the, another question came up to me is about how many people are booked in and by who. So I had our jail staff do the numbers on this. There's, so, there's some differences in numbers, so I want to point that out right away. 
You'll see in 2019, this slide shows 1,990 bookings. And the system, we have other bookings, uh, warrants booked in. The Sioux Falls Police Department reported they arrested 331 people in Lincoln County last year. But if they arrest a Lincoln County inmate or a Lincoln County person with a warrant out of Lincoln County, the jail actually records the arrest. So it skews that number a little bit. My mouth is super dry. Um, so Sioux Falls Police Department, on average, looks like they are between 11 and 15% of the arrests in Lincoln County. T Police Department is 8%, up to 9%. Uh, Lenox Police Department is 3%, Worthing 0, Canton Police Department 7%, the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office is 32 to 41%, Highway Patrol is 6%, so the majority of arrests are made by the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office. The Sioux Falls Police Department is not, I've heard the number 80%, it's just not true. And this is just a, this is just a graph showing those percentages, the, it's the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office and other. A Minneapolis County Sheriff's Office is a huge part of the other. That's because if anybody arrested with a, a Lincoln County warrant goes to their jail, they book them in as a Minneapolis County jail arrest, basically. They're serving the warrant. Their jailers are serving the warrant. So it's just the way it's logged into the computer. Uh, this is from the Garno study just the population growth and how he's calculating his numbers for future projections. Um, this is just the increase that we're, we're spending and this year it'll be, um, I'm gonna estimate about $1.8 million. And again, this is just rental beds. This is not transportation costs or uh, staffing costs. This was put together by Casey Peterson out of Rapid City, and I used uh, Kevin Tome, the sheriff in Pennington County, to figure these numbers in, staffing numbers in. Now, he uses direct, super, direct supervision in Pennington County. That's where the, the, the staff is actually with the inmates in the pod. During the research of this, I found that that's really kind of going by the wayside because there's a much... Uh, cheaper way to staff using indirect supervision. And the architects will show you what that looks like. You're, there's, a, there's a guard standing in a pod, secured pod, and can oversee all the inmates with one and then a rover two. So the, the staffing will actually be considerably less than this, and they'll go over that on how that model works. This is also from the Casey Peterson study. Now, to, to clarify, this number of $12.78, that's at full capacity with other inmates. Uh, Commissioner Aarons had reached out to a Turner County, or a Turner County reached out to him. That commissioner called me on, they would, they would like 10 beds at a facility if built. Now, on the, the federal inmates, because I know that was asked, is... Federal inmates, they're, weren't, they're, they wouldn't be inmates coming from Chicago, uh, Minneapolis. They're already here. These, these people are, are in our community, and when they're being housed, they're in Minneapolis County, Clay County, uh, Yankton County. They're, they're at Win, the city of Winter houses them. They're, the federal system doesn't, they, they, how, they hold inmates in county jails, just like counties do before they're sent to prison. And if they, if, when they leave, they leave out of the federal courthouse. So these inmates wouldn't be coming in the facility and leaving the facility to roam around our communities. I have family in Lincoln County, so I, I just would hope people would trust that that's not something that would happen. That number, the $12, doesn't include the, the payment on the building either. So the, the, the building, would be separate, and the auditor will go over the cost of that. Um, so here's the current situation we're in. Minneapolis County, we're, we're one year into a contract, so we have four left. I've, I've, 
I talk to the Minion County Sheriff very regularly, and he assures me that that can be extended. Um, but they did build their jail 20-year projections on Minnehaha County numbers. Our numbers are not included in there. So we won't make the 20-year mark with the current projections. So, like I said, I think 10 years is pretty reasonable, but at the end of 10 years, and, we're asked, and, and we were asked to find other place for our inmates uh, a couple years ago, and that's where the nine jails and three states came from, and that would be in our future again, and I really don't think it's a possibility to do again, unless we're gonna bus them much further, but they have to be in South Dakota. Um, numbers are consistently higher than projected. That is, when COVID hit, they bonded a bunch of, bunch of people out. So our numbers dipped, uh, and Minneapolis County reduced our minimum requirement from 45 to 25. So if people have seen the, the numbers, that, the bills that have been, that have been uh, put online, you'll see one month dips to 92,000, and I'm just taking these off memory. And then last month was 184,000. Now there was some back months, I believe it was two months, that they didn't bump our contract back up to 45, and we're only charging us for the inmates that were in there. So they backed that up and charged us for 45 a month, regardless of the number that we have in there. So that's why that bill spiked. It was, there were some overages from July and August in there, or June and July. Um, so other options are, after 45, do we move inmates to other counties, or do we just house everybody in Minneapolis County? And our, other, our options are Union and Charles Mix at 67 and 97 miles away. Now, if you research the most dangerous time that you have with an inmate is during transportation. And that's, that's not a made up fact. We just had that happen on in the interstate between the two exits at T a couple weeks ago where an inmate attacked a guard, uh, forced him to drive down the ditch, they opened the door, shoved him out, and the guy stole the patrol car. So it can happen, and it happens right here. 2024, we will have a 7,800 inmate with no guaranteed for housing. Again, I think there is a guarantee for the next six to 10 years, but depending on what the, the inmate population grows in Sioux Falls. The other issue was a courtroom being, or the courthouse being out of space with no options to add a courtroom. And that's the difference between a jail and a public safety center. We, the inmates that are being held long term, like the Mr. Boudouin that's up on the, the homicide charges, he would never leave that facility. He would appear in court uh, in that facility. The people that get arrested for uh, driving at a revocation, DUI, that typically bond out right away, they would continue to drive down to Canton for court. So that's the, that would be the difference between the public safety center and the jail, but the jail is part of the, the equation. And that's my presentation, the information that I gathered for the commission to make their decision. Uh, thank you, Sheriff. Um, I think it gives us a basis for a lot of questions. Um, there still are going to be some out there for afterwards. Which take us to our auditor. I think we'll go through some of the numbers, which is, again, a lot of the questions. So um, here's a microphone, if you, like, if you like. And just for you to know, I'm going out to the audience so I can see the presentation as well as all of you. Thank you. Okay, so the question was asked about what it would cost at $100,000 worth of valuation on your tax impact. This graph that we have here shows from 100000 to 500000 what the tax impact would be. Um, so on 100000 it would be $26.20. If the levy stayed stagnant, the valuation stays stagnant, that is what it would be. If you go to... 
The next slide, we show that the courthouse bond started out in 2006 with a .280 levy. By now, in 2020, the levy is down to .088. So you can see that as the valuation increases and the growth increases, the levy amount goes down. So where we're saying $26.20, or what was it, 26 whatever it was, it would go down over the years, the 2620, based on the fact that we are continuing to grow, our values are continuing to grow up. This is the valuation versus growth because the valuations would, they derive from the, the taxes derive from the valuation. The more valuation we have, the lower the levy. So as a growth is part of the valuation, the bigger part is the valuation of the properties, businesses. As they increase, the levy goes down. That's all I have. If I can uh, clarify, uh, Madam Auditor, the number you're seeing, 35 million, is based off of what has now been gained as an est a closer estimate of what we're looking at for costs. The initial bond request was 50 million before we had the opportunity to hire an architect to know for sure what we were looking at for our needs. Um, in their presentation, you're going to, I think, hear that their projections are actually 32 to 34 uh, on the safe side. Uh, she has pla placed 35 million, is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Doug, where are you? Are you ready? I will turn it over to you guys if you're ready at this point. You're gonna have a presentation from the architects at this time to show you the concepts, answer some of the site location or uh, design and building design. And gentlemen, just so everyone knows about how long do you think this might take? All right, very good. If everyone could keep uh, any side nose, uh, noises down so everyone can hear properly, that would be appreciated. Thank you. All right, now you can hear me. Um, so my name is Tony Vi. I'm an architect at Elevatus Architecture. We're out of Fort Wayne, Indiana, um, and uh, we specialize in designing uh, detention facilities. Um, it's, uh, it's all I do. It's what my career has been uh, for the last eight years. If I could take a jail and grind it up and brush my teeth with it, I would. Uh, and I believe that's one of the reasons uh, uh, why uh, the commission selected our firm. Uh, but my job here is to kind of introduce you into a, a jail facility, uh, the spaces in them, uh, what makes them tick a little bit, and uh, maybe how they look even. Um, so with that, if we could move on to the next slide. So here is a general diagram of how a jail works. And let me get my fancy little pointer out. That's not it. Oh, you can't hardly see that, but I'll do my best here. So um, I, I break, broken down a, and diagrammed a, a jail for you here, and we'll start on, a, on the top side here. Um, a, a public entry here uh, in a facility like this would typically have an x-ray machine, a metal scanner, uh, a, a, um, a sheriff's officer uh, to screen for, for safety and security. Um, as part of this project's program, we have uh, a treasurer's office substation um, that really uh, doesn't help the jail function, but it is a convenience um, for the people on the northern side uh, of the county. Um, part of this facility will include a court um, with uh, 
the ability to easily add on future courts if that's needed. Um, every jail typically has a uh, sheriff's administration. Um, that's important. Um, and that is, uh, we, we try to seclude this a bit from the, from the jail space because this can be built out of metal studs and jipboard. Um, pretty inexpensive and efficient way to build a building. Uh, but as we get down into these green spaces, um, these are the detention spaces. Uh, we have uh, the uh, intake area. Uh, where inmates are booked. You also have padded cells typically in there, uh, some uh, medical um, infirmary. Um, we have a vehicular sally port, uh, which we'll see a picture of later, uh, but that basically has two large overhead doors and transport vehicles drive in one door, it closes, it's secured, uh, and an inmate or detainee is pulled out, uh, taken straight into the intake area where they're booked. Um, inmate services here, uh, which are uh, things like um, laundry, uh, kitchen, commissary, uh, maybe uh, there, there, there can be some, some program areas. Oh, look at this. Nice. I appreciate that help. Thanks. Um, and then anytime we design a jail, it doesn't matter for what county and what part of the country, um, you, you've, you've got to be able to design these things so they can be added on. I don't know if you guys are ever going to need more beds, um, but most county jails uh, that we do, uh, they're replacing old, worn-out jails um, that are overcrowded and overpopulated without a way to add on to them. So we, we consider uh, the future uh, early on uh, in, our, uh, in our design process. The next slide just kind of shows you the same thing, but it's more of a three-dimensional thing. It kind of shows you how a, uh, a jail building is massed. Most of it's uh, a one-story. Uh, we have done multiple-story uh, jails before. Uh, they're expensive. They're hard to run. Uh, and um, on this site, it's not needed. So, so I want to introduce you to, <laughs> to, to this. Anybody ever play with one of these as a kid or ever seen these? Am I the only one? Yeah. So th this helps me illustrate the 80-20 rule uh, that is defined really in the ACA, which is kind of the go-to standards for uh, designing uh, detention facilities. And what that says is you might have, for easy math, we'll say 100 beds, but your really operating capacity is 80. So it's 80% of your overall beds is your operating capacity. And the reason why is the same reason why there's a missing tile out of this puzzle. You've got to be able to slide those tiles around in that puzzle. Same thing in a jail. As, as inmates are brought in, detainees are, are brought in, and they're classified, um, you've got to have the ability to shift different classifications around to, to, to meet the population demands of the jail. And it's really a, 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 an important uh, operating char characteristic uh, for the jail staff. So that's important to, uh, to remember. So when you hear maybe 200 beds, um, remember that it's 160 usable beds uh, to the sheriff. So we're gonna go into some pictures of some typical jail spaces um, that, that you'd see, that you can expect to see in a, in a jail. The picture on the right is a typical kind of uh, a small screening, security screening space that would be in that main entrance. Uh, the picture on the left is uh, uh, the public lobby for a jail. Um, not a big space, um, but it's the front door. It's what the public sees. It's what they experience uh, when they come in. Next slide, please. Uh, this particular jail will include a court. Um, this is a picture of a court that we've done. Um, you'll notice that it's very court feeling, but it's not overly elaborate. We're not building Taj Mahals here. This is an intake area. Um, you'll notice that uh, the operating center, uh, which, is, which is known as the booking desk or the booking desk, uh, low walls, um, they're built up a little bit taller in uh, uh, strategic places uh, to protect computer screens and that sort of thing. Uh, but everything's left low for good sight lines. It's important, good sight lines, because um, down here are holding cells. Um, those can be for new detainees brought in, or they could be for uh, troubled inmates or protective custody, uh, padded cells that need to be watched continuously. Next slide, please. So this is that vehicular sally port. And uh, when I took this picture, my back was to the other door. But on the other side, there's another door just like this. So the operation is one door opens. And in a, in a sally port, in a jail, all of these doors are interlocked. So if there's one door open, it is impossible for any other door to be unlocked and opened unless the uh, control officer goes through a whole lot of uh, hoops and uh, red screens and buttons to make that happen. Uh, but that's all part of the safety and security of the jail. 
So I want to take a second. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about all the different parts that I talked about, um, but one that we do know about is, is the general housing pod. And I'm not sure. It looks like that's kind of kind of hard to read. Um, but in this housing pod, this is, this is a housing pod for another uh, county jail that we designed. Um, it's roughly 200 beds. Um, but what you see in all of these sort of pie-shaped uh, areas, those are uh, housing pots, or th those are uh, cell blocks. And each one of those is a classification. So it could be a male, it could be a female, it could be pre-trial, post-trial. But the reason why they're at these odd angles is um, back in the day, we used to put control officers, one officer, in each day room. That's called direct supervision. And al although that's got a lot of advantages in running a jail, the big disadvantage is it's very, very expensive on a county because those are full-time positions that have to be staffed. And every full-time full position in a jail means you've got to hire five to seven officers uh, because, one, they're not going to work 24-7. Um, they want vacations and they want sick time and, and their, their weekends off. Um, so what we do is we organize this so there can be one person in the center um, in, in what we call housing control. Uh, and they have excellent sight lines into every housing pot. And that's one way, uh, when, we, when we talk about designing and building efficient jails, um, it's not just with the, the bricks and mortar and the pipes and the duct work, but it's also efficiency in staff. Because bricks and mortar, you'll pay off. The staff that you have to, have to pay to run this jail is forever. So this is one example of how we design efficient jails from an operating standpoint. Next slide, please. So this is a shot uh, in this particular jail. This is an elevated housing control. And uh, I, um, you, you see the outside or the, the glass here, and that's tight by design. Uh, it provides actually better sight lines when, when the officer is sitting here. And then if you look through that glass, you'll see the day room glass on the other side. So that's an idea of what that looks like. In this particular jail, it's elevated on the second floor. It really maximizes views. But uh, there's advantages of, of elevated control towers and, and advantages of them to have them just on a raised platform on the first floor. Next slide, please. So I'll, uh, I wanted to uh, show you some, some shots of what, uh, what a housing uh, day room looks like. Uh, so there's 10 of them in this, in this pinwheel, so we would say that's 10 classifications. Next slide, please. And this is, this is what it looks like. Uh, around the back, along the back, we have cells. Uh, it's double tiered. Um, that, that's an efficiency. And although it looks tight in here, um, there's actually a little bit of space at my back. Um, but the size of this is controlled uh, by humanitarian uh, guidelines outlined in ACA. Um, so this is uh, an efficient use, even though it's, it's of a certain size. Uh, we, we really strive to hit the square footage that we have to for the number of inmates in these uh, to a T. Next slide, please. Um, and the cells we use today, um, uh, back, back in the day, they, you know, a lot of precast concrete or uh, CMU. Uh, today we like to do the cells out of prefabricated um, steel modular cells. Uh, and there's a couple manufacturers uh, in, the, in the country. But this is what it is. It's basically a box. They're prefabricated in a factory. Everything in here is put in in the factory. The beds, the toilet, the sprinkler head, the camera, the light, everything. And then it's wrapped up, put on a truck, shipped here, and then they stack them like Legos. Uh, it's an efficiency uh, in the construction, um, in the construction uh, schedules. Um, and it's also a, a security and safety thing because these are built very well and there's very little nooks and crannies to hide contraband. Next slide, please. So one thing I want to talk about is, uh, this is, the, of course, a housing pod we've been talking about. Um, but one of these, these pies is not actually a day room. It's, it's a recreation yard. Uh, and this is actually an, um, an outdoor rec. And you can say, wait a minute, it's inside the building. How is it outdoor rec? Well, on the outside of this building here, in this exterior wall, there's a coiling overhead door. It's up high, and it's secured with bars and insect screens. Um, but you can roll that up, put inmates in, and technically that's their outdoor rec. And what this is, this is a modern day way uh, to eliminate the outdoor recs. So what you don't get in a modern day jail is the outdoor rec yards, the guys in jumpsuits playing basketball, and lifting weights around chin link fence. That doesn't happen in modern day uh, county jails. And if you go to the next slide, and this is an example of an outdoor rec. 
And you can see they raise that coiling overhead door. They do that remotely. Uh, that lets in fresh air. It lets in the light. And uh, the inmate gets their hour of rec every day. Uh, and another component uh, in a modern day jail is uh, the sort of hallway. It's a very narrow hallway, but we call this a rear chase. And what happens is these inmates, um, sometimes they get bored, and one of their favorite things to do is clog their toilet, flush it a bunch of times, and flood their cell. Um, so back in the day, a maintenance guy would have to walk in there, um, take a, a bunch of tools, and uh, take the toilet off, fix it, put it back up. With this, with this uh, exterior, this what we call a rear chase, um, that maintenance person can take his tool cart into the rear chase, address the problem, and he never has to take a, a, a tool that he's, got, that he's got to worry about inventorying uh, into the secured perimeter, into the cell block. If you go to the next slide, there's a picture of that. Pretty tight, um, but, but effective. And this is, this is a safety security measure. Some technology that we find in modern day jails. Um, the picture on the right shows, this is, would be in a public lobby. Um, this is called video visitation. Um, no more is there the, um, the glass and two people are talking on a phone. Um, it's certainly an option if, if the sheriff likes that. But what we find more and more is in a day room, there is a device that looks just like this. And uh, the inmate can be on that side. And then out in a public lobby, there's this space. Or if um, the, uh, the public would rather, they can just pipe that in at home on an iPad or a computer. The picture on the left is a small uh, interview room that also doubles as video arraignment. So this is a way to find efficiency in running a jail where inmates don't necessarily have to be transported uh, for arraignment purposes anyway. They can be arraigned uh, remotely. Of course, that's subject to uh, judges' cooperation. Some judges really like this because it's so efficient. Other judges, kind of old school, they, they, they want the inmate uh, in their courtroom. And uh, in the inmate services, um, we have uh, laundry. Um, commercial grade um, um, that are actually designed. Uh, the, we, we figure the load based on the inmate count. We, we, we put in the uh, machines to meet that demand, but we, we build in extra space so as inmate grows, um, those machines can be taken out, larger ones put in their place, uh, and that's how we plan for uh, future expansion uh, in the laundry. Next slide. And the next one is a kitchen. It's done the same way. So um, that's how we build in future expandability in a jail. It's not, we're not adding more square footage. It's the ability to put larger uh, equipment uh, in there. Next slide, please. So this is kind of a, just a, a quick uh, uh, stab at, at your site and how a, a jail facility could lay out. Um, of course, this is um, just a couple options on drives. Um, but what you're going to notice here, uh, we've, we've, we've separated the, the public parking uh, with staff parking. We kind of use the building to shield that. Um, we've got a drive all the way around the building uh, for fire access on all sides. Uh, the vehicle sally port on this, on this side. And deliveries for kitchen, trash, that sort of thing would also be on the back side. What you'll notice here uh, goes to kind of what I was saying earlier. Um, no fences. Uh, no big razor ribbon, electric shock fences. That's, that's, that's a thing you find in, in big state and federal penitentiaries, but not in county jails, not anymore. Next slide. And just to drive that home, this is, this is a jail uh, that opened in 2017 that we did. Um, and uh, I, I selected this one just because we happen to have good pictures of it. But this is the front of the jail. Um, doesn't have to look like a jail. Uh, it, it, it can look like an industrial building with a nice office component on the front. Uh, next slide. Moving around to the back of the building, you see the vehicle sally port here. Um, you see uh, some, some additional parking here. Um, maybe some security gates here. Um, next slide, please. And you'll see the only, the only fences we have, we have a fence around the generator. We have a fence um, around the dumpsters because that's a, that was a local co code ordinance. Uh, even though it's behind the building, you can't see it from the road. Uh, and then this fence down here is um, actually an auxiliary. It serves an auxiliary purpose. This is the county fuel tanks, and the county just wanted to secure those. Um, so no place are there, uh, big, ugly outdoor wrecks. Next slide, please. 
So this, we, we, we took uh, uh, an opportunity to just kind of throw together some quick renderings. And this is, this is kind of just an architect um, designing uh, something that would be indicative to uh, what our price estimate, our cost estimate, uh, we put together. We didn't have any input from the, from the sheriff, the commissioners on this, so um, it may or may not look just like this. We're not sure yet. Next slide, please. But the point here is it can, it can be a good looking building for the money that you're spending. Yeah. You don't have to spend a ton of money to, uh, to make it look good and it certainly doesn't have to look like a jail. Next slide. Next slide. Very approachable. This would be the public entrance here. Um, side exit uh, for the court building. Next slide, yep. Next slide. You here you'll see some, some bollards that we strategically place for uh, protection against vehicular attack. It's very common. Next slide, please. Yeah. So when we talk about the cost of projects, um, we, we break it down in a couple different components. We have the construction cost uh, that us as architects are responsible to monitor. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, there's also what's called the soft, the soft cost. And I, and I, sh I should say it just, just for the record to make sure uh, the, the folks online. Uh, we, we estimate this construction cost to be 26.6, uh, 26.7 million dollars construction cost only. Soft cost at 5.3, that's an estimated cost at this point, but soft cost covers things like our fee, engineering fees, uh, it, it covers uh, the furniture, it covers the cost of equipment, so the sheriff's gonna have to buy shackles and more cuffs and mattresses. Uh, it's gonna, co uh, the, the cost of detention equipment, computers, um, those sorts of things. And, 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 and since this is a, a new jail that we would anticipate there's not gonna be a whole lot of stuff that can be brought over from the old jail. For, for what we anticipate roughly, I mean, if you do the math, um, I, I think it comes out to just a few thousand dollars higher, but, but about $32 million total project cost is, our, is what we anticipate now. And what, what I wanna stress here, take the time to, to stress here, is our construction cost at 26.6, 26.7 million dollars, that assumes uh, that we collect bids in spring. And what is important to understand is it's not just this county that's, that's considering building jails, but it's happening all across the country. Um, and the cost to get a detention equipment is going through the roof right now. And where I'm going with this is inflation for, for detention facilities is about, um, it's about $100,000 a month. So every month you delay building this, the, the cost of this project goes up about $100,000. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but I can tell you there's only a few manufacturers that make detention steel doors and only a few manufacturers that make uh, uh, prefabricated steel cells and only a few manufacturers that make all these things that you need in a jail that make a jail a jail. And uh, what you, you can't assume that you're just going to get the fair rate because I can tell you just in, in, in Indiana, we've got Wayne County, uh, which is 3,500 bed in Detroit, Marion County with 3,000 bed jail in Indianapolis. Those are just two in the Midwest um, that are really sucking the industry uh, really right now. So the cost to build a jail is, is, is really, really high and it is, it's, it's been high and it's just going up and up. So just keep that in mind uh, that the cost of uh, the inflation and in detention uh, facilities is, is really, really shooting up right now. Next slide, please. So if we look at this, and, and this is very rough for us, and, and I think that there's, there's uh, more accurate numbers been presented, but um, annual bond payment by our rough calculators, and we're architects, we're not bond writers or accountants or, or financial advisors, but that bond payment's probably gonna be in a roughly $1.8 million. And we already know, if you, if you go to the next slide, that the red payment, so to, to send inmates out uh, to other county jails, um, we anticipate in, this, in the following years, uh, gonna touch that $2 million number. 
So I know there's a lot more that goes into these numbers. These are very rough and very preliminary. Um, but I just wanted to point that out. If you go to the next slide. So with, with this, there, there, I, we believe that there's going to be a financial savings at this very rough level. But I think we all know that there's there more that goes into these numbers. Now, there's a, there was a couple comments um, that, that I'd like to address earlier. There was a lot of concern about the civil design and the drainage. And although we haven't had the um, a topo survey done, we haven't done those engineering things, I want to rest assured not only the civil engineer pay close attention to that, but every municipality that I've worked in, um, there is a formal drainage review process, and I'm not exactly sure how that happens in this county. Um, but it's just not the engineers. Nobody takes the engineer's word for it and says, we're going to build it this way. Um, local participation in bidding, and I'm really glad this point was made. Um, depending on the, the, the construction delivery method, and what I mean by that is how is this going to get built, we haven't decided on that, the commissioners. That's a whole nother probably 45-minute hour, hour uh, conversation. But there are ways that we can build in into the way this project's bid is to make sure that we can include fair uh, opportunities for local participation. So if there's a local mechanical contractor, local electrical contractor, paint or drywall or those sorts of things, we definitely want to get the local community, the local contractors that have a really good shot at winning this work because we want that money to stay local. And soil borings. So we haven't seen any soil borings yet, but that is part of a, uh, an early process we'll do before we start designing the, uh, the foundations. So to my knowledge, uh, those haven't been done from an engineering standpoint, uh, but certainly the due diligence we do as we get into the, the real design. And I believe that's all I have. That is, I think, the conclusion of the formal presentation, unless I miss somebody. Um, but we are, as opposed to having to have an official, but it is open to the public for questions. The, uh, the presenters here have uh, offered specific to what they've presented. Um, if there's anybody that has a specific question, please come up and ask what that question is, and hopefully we can answer it. If we can focus on certain parts of the presentation, their structure there, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Uh, are you, what, what edition of the IBC and the IFC are you using for this? Well, the, the direct answer is, is we're not yet because we're not designing. We're not to that okay. level of design yet. So depending on what you find in the code, these numbers could go up or down? Um, the, the square footage numbers? Not the square footage, but just what's required. From I wouldn't anticipate the construction costs to go up or down. I mean, in, in there, we've got all of the typical, the fire protection, the fire alarms, uh, the life-saving, uh, the, the uh, egress with the, the number of doors out. So I wouldn't anticipate our construction costs to be affected uh, by, a code, by a code study or code review. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm addressing Nine Mile Creek, which you're building it right basically on it. Uh, has there been any mention of Nine Mile Creek on this whole project? Uh, it has been mentioned. Um, I don't know a tremendous about Nine Mile Creek, but we are north of that. Um, this, this building is going to be, um, well, the way we've kind of studied it to this point, uh, sort of in the, the upper quadrant of that property, which clears Nine Mile Creek, from what I can tell. I mean, it's setting up and over, but it's still going to impact Nine Mile Creek. Uh, there is a study on that, and who's here? That yeah. 
learn how to run this. Doug, um, as we've all lived in that area, we all know what Nine Mile Creek is. And that is one of the reasons I was very adamant that this property, irrelevant to purchasing it for potentially other uses, it needed to be protected. We are in the midst of trying to contract with Wink Associates, who have been our consultants. This is not an official action by any means by the board yet. They're trying to come with us with a study, uh, a presentation to tell us how we improve this to better the drainage control in there. This site for many years has been identified as something, as an area that if have the opportunity to improve it, uh, the concept of buying it was never on the option because at the, at the one time that it was for sale, uh, the number was astronomical, even much higher than what it was purchased for. Uh, but now with the opportunity to possibly use this for dual purposes, it led to a good opportunity to do, tackle two issues. So the, to get into a little bit more specific of a how do we improve the drainage in that area, there's really two options. One of it is to excavate out and create an, a, holder, a bigger holding basin for water. Now again, this is not what is being presented. It was something that was discussed with Wink and Associates, um, not as a board, but in discussions with them when we're working through how do we improve this. This happened as far back as 2016, no, not 16, 2018. Uh, with them about how do we improve some of the other, including Nine Mile Creek watershed basins. The other option would be to simply raise Sundowner Road, which is two, oh no, uh, what, no, whatever that road number is, forgive me for not knowing that off the top of my head, which then would create a bigger holding basin, but then we're talking about contacting adjacent landowners and having to acquire, um, you know, easements for water retention. Like, there's a long process to that. It's going to take dollars. There are funds available. We're going to try to pursue those as well to to pay for the study and or impl implementation of that. But it's it's a long road. Anything in government takes a long time, Doug. Well, but Nine Mile Creek, there has been a study. They did a 10-year study, was it? The We've Bureau spent a we as as and it was a 10-year study. They showed us stuff, and they said it's going to be a long time. So, how could you do this when it's going to take us a long time for Nine Mile Creek? Well, it's all it's all a step process, Doug. So, in other words, if you want to build a jail, you can uh, ask you get her going quicker then what you're saying as far I think we're talking about we are talking about two separate issues no the, we're talking about nine mile creek okay nine mile creek yeah, the, yeah it's it's a, it'll be a different funding mechanism for improving nine mile creek's watershed basin but the idea that we uh, allowing that area to develop as could have because as we all know surprisingly only about half of what is considered slough I'm going to use that word is actually deemed as wetland the other area could have been filled in by a developer or still could be filled in. Uh, my standpoint from the county is now we need to protect as much of that water basin, shed basin as possible. And the best way to do it is, unfortunately, with the taxpayer money to do so. Because municipalities and developers don't consider us enough when they're doing something and we have to take action, unfortunately, because it does. I think the word has been used several times, dumped on us, and that's what happens. This is gonna give us an opportunity to make an impact for the future. It's unfortunate that it is, falls onto the county to do that, but you've, you've been in our meetings, you, you hear oh, it. I've been in a lot of Nine Mile Creek yep. meetings. Yeah, and they just- And a lot of the people here they have shot, been. They shove it off. Yeah. Yeah, it's been amazing. And I've, I've unfortunately been part of a lot of those meetings. This is yeah. going to give us an opportunity. It's not going to be a quick fix, but it does give us an opportunity to make an inroad into it. But how long can we put this off until we get that nine mile brick figured out? Well, this is going to be built on a highest part of the parcel that was purchased. Yeah, but you're still flooding out the people south or east and in the site there. plan though, there would still be engineering not to impact any additional. Um, so then uh, out of the other areas that are buildable, we would not encourage anything at this point in time. Well, I would have to say that and maybe buy out a few. Yeah, that may be part of it. Yeah. I, it could be coming, depending on what the, the floodplain or the Nine Mile Creek analysis presents to us. But that, unfortunately, we don't have that answer, uh, uh, what that will actually be. But hopefully we'll know in 
you know, newer than later future, but it's a great question, Doug. how to use a microphone. Uh, do you know what's missing from the last slide that you're looking at right now? Operational cost. There it is, yeah. That's only half the story. Agreed. What, One is, point, Mr. Chairman, it's my opportunity now. I, I would, may I, just for clarification? I'm at... Excuse me, I am the chair. I'm rightfully wrong. I just want to know what does the Casey Peterson study tell us? Mr. Chairman. Yes, you have the floor. Thank I'll you. I'll proceed. Now, on the condensed statement of cash flows that uh, the commissioners were provided by the auditor, it gives a column called expenditures and it gives subcategories to that. I don't know if any of you were provided with this information ahead of time. In fact, it says total payroll, 2.4 million, total care and treatment, 474,000, total facility expenditures, 332, total safety and sanitation, 45, my printout here doesn't give the next column, but I think it says 43,000. And then it says total other expenditures, 180,000. So I'm just giving some uh, back of the envelope math here, but that's about 3.5 million per year in money that the county would have to expend in order to pay to run the facility. Now we don't have that money in the current county budget. We're going to have to turn around and either dip into our reserves. We just so everybody knows, we've got about nine thousand nine million dollars in reserves right now. So that'll get us what three years? Is that right? We got about nine million in reserves. Is that is that our number, Madam Auditor? Now, if it's more, well, we've got more. But if it's less, the issue then becomes is, how do we fund the annual operations of the jail? Well, this jail could pass in November, but then the commission will have to turn right around and try to figure out how to fund it out of our current budget. Now, during this last budget year, we were asked, actually, to do an opt-out for seven million, five million, and three million. I offered 600,000 to pay for the sheriff's deputies. That was turned down. I was asked if I would go up to a million. Um, but that wasn't accepted. So the question now becomes is where does the county find the money to run the jail? And according to the condensed statement of cash flows, we're going to need about 3.5 million a year. And that's steady state numbers. That doesn't include inflation. Now, according to the sheet I have here for the first five years, it looks like there's about $70,000 a year increase in expenditures. So you extrapolate that over the course of 30 years and you get about $2 million. So overall, that's about $107 million over the course of the next 30 years to run the jail. So, that's just more information that wasn't put on the PowerPoint today. And also, well, Commissioner Gillespie's pointing out to me here, uh, no CPA provides any assurance on these items. So these numbers are solely, were solely uh, provided by somebody inside the county apparatus on this. So I'd simply ask people to take a look at all the information become an informed voter, ask the tough questions, regardless of how you want to vote, get out there and vote. I couldn't agree more with Commissioner Aarons on this.
if, if I may respond, and I don't agree with his cost uh, numbers at all, but what he doesn't disclose, those are based on full operations. At full operations, either our inmate population has exploded and we have our own inmates to take care of, or we're housing prisoners from outside of our county, which would generate, by the analysis that he was referring to, $2.7 million annually to offset the cost of operations. That wasn't disclosed. I think, in fairness, that should be included in this statement. Secondly, uh, I want to go over, what was your second point, Commissioner Aarons, that you were talking about um, the cash flow and then what was the a guarantee, oh yeah, by the way, we have no guarantee what Minneapolis County is going to charge us. We have no guarantee how many inmates that we have to pay for. There is no guarantee. What is the shock going to be if our number goes from 50 to 60 to 70 to 80 to 90 to 100? There's no guarantee on that either, folks. Unfortunately, we're trying to present with you an option that will control and have the opportunity to control your own destiny is what's going on in the future for this county. We took a leap back in 08 and built on to the addition to the courthouse. It was a big stretch at that time. We were much smaller at that point in time too. We're very proud. We have a great thing going. I just want us to leave our, uh, the, our uh, next generation in a very good sound position to uh, control their destiny because there are no guarantees and that's exactly right. So uh, we have a question in the audience, please. Uh, my next, first question is, is there an alternate site or is this it? For the, t for the vote in November, this is the... No, no, for the location. Okay, if, if the folks, um, Commissioner Gillespie and Commissioner Aarons were in, in the commissioner meetings when we discussed sites. I'm going to yield to them if they want to discuss how site selection went first. I'm going to pull this mass down because I think you can talk a lot clearer. Yes. Uh, it kind of echoes in here, so pardon me. Um, yes, uh, I don't have a date, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe last spring uh, the chairman uh, brought to our attention of possibly some property between the airport and the city of T that could be purchased. Um, and uh, this was in executive session. And then, of course, COVID came in pretty strong, and everything kind of got quiet for a while. We also have uh, uh, litigation going on right now that hasn't been settled, so it, it, it quieted down for quite a while. And uh, I didn't know exactly where this property was, but uh, I knew it was between the T Airport and the city of T, and uh, uh, the approximate price was in what, approximately what we paid for it. But uh, uh, it kind of went dormant for a while. And um, I just, I want to talk a little bit here. And Sheriff Swenson, please bear with me. Uh, is, does he have any other questions, sir? Uh, as far as costs, when you mentioned that I'm just going to use around number two million to operate this, will that more than likely get just passed down? added on to our property tax? All county operation. See, that's, that's the thing in the state of South Dakota. The thing is in the state of South Dakota, folks, county operations are funded through property taxes. Okay. Unfortunately, we don't have a diverse enough tax base at the county level to be able to engage in these kinds of major projects. Now, there's some counties who do it. Minnehaha, they do it. They've got a larger population center. It allows them to be able to take advantage of economies of scale. Lincoln County, unfortunately, although we're growing, we've got a, we're almost solely reliant on property taxes. We don't have a sales tax. We don't have an excise tax. We don't have other types of tax revenue to draw upon and so what it creates in the state of South Dakota is unfortunately the inability to be able to draw upon bed and booze tax and those kinds of things. So we're stuck having to rely upon property taxes, but we also have to fund the rest of county operations with that. Now, uh, as commissioners, we can't just create new taxes. That has to be created by the state legislature. They control what taxes local entities and municipalities 
can create. Sure. Now there's been bills at the state legislature regarding these issues and they've uh, roundly and uniformly failed. Um, so we're stuck having to rely upon property taxes. I'm okay with the property taxes. I just want to know if this gets passed, how soon will you guys put out to us that says estimated cost to operate this is two million, your property taxes are gonna go up X dollars. That's a good question. Right and you know what, sir? Do you guys have a time frame for it, as far as I'm concerned, I urge you to wait until the vote in November okay. before we start talking about having to raise more taxes to pay for a jail that well, hasn't it's even come passed if, yet. If we we're gonna need to man it, so it's inevitable. We will have to pay this. And I'm okay with the jail. I'm just not too tickled about the location. Commissioner Aarons, any comment on the, why the location was picked? I did not initiate or uh, pursue the location. Chairman Poppins brought that location to us and then asked us to discuss it. He would be the number one expert on who? <laughs> on the negotiations. Well, I think this is the first time you've ever used the word expert with me. So. Well, he'd be the I guy to go to. I appreciate it. <laughs> I would, uh, I'm gonna go with a quick lesson on location. There's a lot of criteria that we all discuss and previous board members discuss. I can find in minutes back to uh, the 11th of, of December back in 18, uh, when there's conversation at that point of some land that we had currently acquired for the expansion of the airport. Let's not get on the airport because I, I, I desperately don't want to stay here for 12 hours because we could go for on and on about that. But it goes back to even that far about location. Some of the reasons for picking an area, let's, let's first start on the north side of the county. The population structure is up there. The, the, the police force, the arrests are predominantly on the north half. So why do that? And the conversation, and I don't think there was any disagreement that that made some sense by the board members, that that was a criteria that should be considered a size large enough for growth because too many times you do, you do a project and last next thing you know you're out of space because you couldn't believe how fast you're growing you know the farmer's old adage is if you double the size of the shop that you want it's still too small the day you get it done um you know sorry if it doesn't fit this scenario but what's ringing a bell we're growing i can go back to 2004 when uh, Commissioner uh, Burdell, Copland, uh, Commissioner um, Jim Schmidt, um, uh, Commissioner, oh, forgive me at this moment, I'm trying to remember everyone, but the, um, the point being is we're having an in-depth conversation about did we need to add space. Ultimately, the decision was made to add space at the courthouse. What was believed at that point in time was going to take us generations before we would need more space. I'm very proud of the fact that it didn't. We didn't make it. We're already out of space there. Um, and that's because of the people that live here and why it's so nice to live here. People are good people. It's a great place to live, great place to work, all of that thing. But it did make a realization that we need to understand that we are growing and we need to be prepared for that growth. So a little side spot. There was even some conversations about possibly having this in the city limits of Sioux Falls. That quickly went away when you're looking at price tags of seven to $12 a square foot. Do the math. We couldn't afford it, in my mind. It was just too much of the cost of the structure. There's some advantages that would have been for being in Sioux Falls, but it didn't, didn't weigh the cost. Point blank to the south, to the Canton, there's been uh, questions of why won't we put it out the highway shop? It could be. I'm not going to say it couldn't be. So there's some logistics that have to go on, get to develop. Uh, but again, we, we've talked tonight about, you know, pulling the, the, the people off the streets in Sioux Falls or, or T and then transfer, you know. Is there a perfect spot for this? No. When you've got to start trying to weigh pros and cons, this is not a bad situation. 
And what I'm trying to hopefully stress to those that are concerned about this being next door, there's enough of this land to create a buffer around this that literally I folks, I I've got to build a house. I was going to build it on some of my other land. I would be the first person that would be willing to build a house here. This, this is a great safe place. I w yeah. <laughs> I would love to look at it. I would. Okay. Okay. All right. So there's just everyone's concerned about. I'm not going to tell you that I'm an expert in property values. I can tell you that we've already been approached by other developers that wish to build houses when we determine what we don't have available or don't need for the public safety building. So I hear it all the time. We have, we have those property values questions, whether it be livestock, we have it, farming operations. I can tell you though that this facility is as, as a, let's, let's use the word, I think Doug Putnam, the slough or wetland to the south, great protection there. We have a lagoon to the west. We have an industrial area to the north. We have a campground that unofficially we, uh, as I think the sheriff may or may not want to comment on, frequent quite often. So we need to find a spot that's logistical, met a lot of the criteria. I'm not gonna tell you that it's gonna make everyone happy. I know that. But when we looked at the criteria that was pertinent to us, this does seem like a logical place, at least as an option. Are there other places? Absolutely. I'm not going to tell you it can't be built anywhere else. That's not what I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you that it's an opportunity to two things, possibly build a public safety center on, but more importantly, too, control that nine mile creek, because I have sat on this commission for 12 years and I've heard about Nine Mile Creek for longer than that. And it does have to be protected. I do believe the impact if this facility does get built will be pretty significantly or uh, insignificant to the floodplain issue because we will be able to control what else goes on in that 154 acres. Thank you for letting me do it. You have a question though. Yeah, I got a couple questions. Uh, actually one, Kevin Wheeler, Terry Lane T. Uh, for the architects, are you familiar with the American Jail Association? Um, I assume you guys work with them and know of that. Um, I guess just to verify his numbers, I mean, I've looked, they average about $100 a day per inmate, so double checking your math. Um, that is in check, I agree with that, but uh, the sheriff showed that, I mean, as long as, I think it said 60 and then 75 other county, like inmates, we could, it would be $12 a day per inmate. So it's like, I guess we should just build jails everywhere if we have an eight time markup on our investment. So maybe we should build one in Canton and here. But another serious question for you would be, uh, is there any other county anywhere in the country where there's, how many bed facility is this proposed to be? It's 200, correct? Is that? Just, sure. Yeah, 180 to 190 sure. is what we're proposing. So right is now. there any other counties in the country that have facilities of that size this close together? I mean, we're within 10 miles of Sioux Falls. Um, I've, I've designed a lot of jails, but I certainly can't answer to okay. every county. In I the believe country. if you look, there's nowhere in the country that has that. So um, no. the other thing as the architect, I guess, and I'm not, I mean, I agree we need something, but I mean, we need to be a little more proactive and reactive here and input on this, but uh, as the architects, what have we done for design? As far as I know, every location out there is septic, so how big a septic system are we putting in? And other utilities, like I said, we- This question I think is gonna fall under mine. And I did bring this site, but there was a, this is by far not even the second site that had been discussed by the right. county commission. Um, this was one that was approached actually to us um, and then before making a decision, I, I personally, I don't know if any of the other commissioners spoke with the representation from the city of T. This property has been annexed into the city limits. It has not been changed classification wise. Right. The but it, ha it has been identified as having uh, urbanization uh, for the sewer within two years. 
So T is going to cover that, basically. Yeah, their, their plan is to go out to the Higadorn Industrial Park okay. area and, and actually area out to the airport, the Lincoln County Airport out there as well, okay. so. All right, sounds good. Thank you. I have another question. Um, did you guys, when you were designing this, did, did you guys look at building one that you could build up in the future and what the cost difference was? So uh, one thing I want to stress is we haven't designed this building yet. Okay. So, uh, so, can, so but, but I will address going vertical, vertical yep. jails. Uh, and I think I mentioned it earlier, very difficult to operate and run, uh, both from a safety and security and an operation standpoint. If you've got the land, um, it's, it's, it's better to build uh, as you grow horizontally, if it's feasible. Now, we do jail additions and jails in downtown areas where we don't have a choice but to go up. Um, and it is expensive to, it drives the cost of, of construction to design not the design, but the, to build so you can grow vertically because your foundations increase, your uh, columns increase, your roof structure is designed for a live load, not a dead load of, mm -hmm. of, of uh, well, they, they're both designed for that, but they're much different load criteria. Um, not only that, but when you actually do that construction, unless you plan to vacate that jail below and say, okay, we're gonna add on, you've gotta think about all of those things to, to, to penetrate that roof now so you can build on later and not disturb the operations of the jail. Okay, thank you. So uh, I've got a couple of questions, I guess, for you. Um, sure. Based off your cost analysis, $26.6 million, $26 million. Uh, what percentage of that, or just guesstimate, you got a 200 bed, 160 actual use facility. How many million to build everything within that block, the cell block? Boy, um, let me get my program and I can probably answer that for you. And that's a really tough question to answer, um, but I'll do my best here um, because it's a combination of interior walls, exterior walls, um, plumbing that's there already versus, versus what's not. Um, Probably the housing pod, um, just in and of itself, is probably in the neighborhood of nine million dollars, nine to ten. So uh, ten million with inflation, probably, because in ten years, according to these numbers, 163, we're going to max it out in the housing population. I'm sorry, I couldn't understand you. I'm sorry. 163 in 30-year forecast is when where we're going to be. So 30 years from now, we're going to have to add on another mm -hmm. housing block that costs $10 million is probably roughly what we're going to be looking at. Yeah, and if, if, if that, uh, I, I think, supports the, uh, the bed count that we're, that we're suggesting now, because if this jail lasts you 30 years until you have to add on again, I think job well done. Okay. Yeah. So, so then based off of what I'm seeing, you know, like there's been some... I guess when the commissioner said 10 to $12 a square foot for land, and we got a good rate on land, I can find 10 to $12 a square foot in that budget just by looking at the front of this building here mm -hmm. and costs. I mean, you got about a hundred to $200,000 of windows with that glazing as a contractor. You got cantilevers on the front and mm -hmm. upper side of this building, not to mention this building's facing north. So you're going to be walking in ice all the way up here. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, when I hear, 10 to 12 dollars on a construction cost because of land i look at design of a building and say well if we change something on the design of the building you can afford 
a lot better piece of land just by maybe avoiding some aesthetics a little bit. True. Not now, to mention, you know, then infrastructure. Mm -hmm. City of T is paying for the infrastructure. Now I was told infrastructure for a facility like this is, is tends to be in city limits because of the operations. But City of T pumps all the sewer to Sioux Falls. Mm -hmm. We get our water from Vermilion. We get natural gas from outside of town. I mean, we're already doing everything outside of city limits anyways. Nothing mm -hmm. comes from a city well or anything like that. We don't have a city lagoon, or we have a city lagoon, mm -hmm. but that's going to be gone by the time this thing's built. Mm -hmm. So I guess my concern is why, why was this land picked? I understand it probably makes sense because of Nine Mile Creek, but I mean, the, the building's going to expand south towards the creek more in 30 years. Uh, I, again, there were certain criteria, one of them which I didn't want to take, I already thought I was by the public's response paying too much for land. If I go into the city of Sioux Falls and start paying land for the county's uses of $10, $12 a square foot and having to buy 15 plus acres, uh, you know, I don't know that the public's going to like that either. I, I'd be shocked and if that's what they wish to do, I'd be glad to pursue that. But I'm pretty, pretty sure city taxpayers are going to have to pay 10 to $12 more in the next five years because of infrastructure development due to this facility. If you're talking about the additional land there or? No, I mean, it's, I mean, just the benefit, like the benefit, we're, we're gonna have to pay for it somehow. We're gonna have to pay for the roads going out there. We're gonna have to pay for the infrastructure going out there. The city of, T, city of Sioux Falls has city of T already because of what we're using by the Sioux Falls. We're pumping our sewage up there. What's to say they don't start charging us rates? Now we've got a county building also on the infrastructure. So, so you would suggest that we actually look in the city limits of Sioux Falls to build this? I would say just look at the county. I'm just trying to understand what he's saying. I, I'm Because to me it sounds like he's suggesting that we, we look there. I'm just, is that what you're saying or are you just saying somewhere else? I would say evaluate the decision of what the infrastructure is with the citizens that are voicing a concern. The city of T, citizens of T, also know their infrastructures and all that. Therefore, yes, if property in Sioux Falls makes sense because the jail has a better infrastructure, that's where all the, I mean, the, the sheriff even said it, most of, the, most of the arrests are in city limits, right? So yes, looking at Sioux Falls would make a better option for this facility in my opinion. Oh, any, any comments or questions? Uh, thank you for that comment. Okay. Then I got one more for the sheriff, I guess. Okay. Is sheriff, are you willing to answer a question? You got a mic up there? Or just generic on the base assumption on the inmate processing for the days, uh, assuming the op optional measures of marijuana usage and all that stuff starts getting legalized, what's going to be the change in inmate processing due to those factors. That actually might be a taken. question for council more than anything. You know, the first offense drug user, I don't know that they're spending any time, but I, I'm not the expert on that. Uh, is there any impact that we think on either one of those measures that's going to be based on our uh, prison population? It's a yes or no question. Hopefully we can get that answer. Could everyone hear that? No. Uh, all right, if I may, Mr. Uh, what he was trying to indicate is drugs are associated with the crime. So the individuals are going to jail for the crime. The, the drug aspect is a side note of it. We're not incarcerating that first time user or something like that. So if the individuals are getting arrested just because of drug use, they're not in our system anyway. Uh, is that a good synopsis? If I butchered it, I apologize. Okay, when somebody gets busted with pot here in South Dakota, and it's under two ounces of possession, okay, under two ounces, consider personal use, you get a ticket. It's like a traffic ticket. 
They don't haul you into jail. They don't cuff you and stuff you. Sometimes they do if there's associated crimes involved. But if it's just some kid being stupid and he's got a joint in his hand, they get you, they give you a, tra it's like a traffic ticket, a summons, and you got to go show up in court. Now, the, the, dr the marijuana issue itself, because I know that this thing is on the ballot and you asked the question. This marijuana issue is about 10% of the volume going through the court system right now. But in all honesty and in all fairness to this process, it, we're not putting people in jail who get caught with joints. So that's not a big driver of the population. And I think, as the sheriff will probably tell you, most people get picked up with a joint at a traffic offense. You know, police officer initiates a traffic stop, and most of the time, that's how they get them. You know, they're not going and picking them up in the park or behind somebody's garage. It's at a traffic yeah, offense. I guess my question was just, how does that reflect the numbers and whether or not we're seeing, you know? So if it's violent offenders is mainly what these numbers reflect, then that's obviously not something that's on the ballot me measure currently, so. Yeah, misdemeanor marijuana arrests are not driving jail populations. And while I'm up here, I'm just gonna hit on two things. 11% of Lincoln County's arrests are in the city of Sioux Falls. Not the majority, 11%. Lincoln County, the sheriff's office arrests the majority. Then it's the uh, Sioux Falls Police Department, then T, Harrisburg numbers would be figured in Lincoln County's numbers because Harrisburg is patrolled by Lincoln County. So and then uh, I think it was 7% were in Canton, 3% in Lenox, and I think those are last year's numbers. So 11% of arrests made in Lincoln County are by the Sioux Falls Police Department. Gotcha, Sheriff, so there's 61 how people, in... How many people are... Uh, Sheriff, how many people are of all percentage of our prisoners, how many people are arrested in the first five miles of Lincoln County? I, I can't, I could answer that with some, with some research through our program. That'd be our, it, I can't answer it right now. Probably, I, I, I won't answer it because I don't know. But a, a, a lot of them are within the first five miles. Lenox, T, or I'm sorry, T, Harrisburg, and Sioux Falls are the, the majority of where our arrests come from. So then in your perspective, Sheriff, this land is optimal, but there's other choices around the perimeter of within okay, so five miles of here. Then? I'll go into a little bit of the location, but that's not for my decision. But I will yep. tell you how, how we, this was reached, in my opinion. The Sioux Falls Police Department approached me early on when, when this, the conversation of building our own facility started. They wanted to build with us a report to workstation. So as Commissioner Popper said, we looked at like north of the uh, tall grass treatment center. That was a suggestion of mine. Uh, I live a half a mile from there. So it was, it's, but the land costs were too much. It wasn't developed. So there was, I drove around Lincoln County, the northern end of the county. I looked at Minnesota and 106. I looked at Cliff and 106. Just places that would be centrally located in the northern end of the county. Because when, when you have the Sioux Falls Police Department, what we're going to do if we build this thing too far from where the population is, you're going to drive troopers to work north of the county line. Because they're not going to want to, at 4 o'clock in the morning, take that extra hour and a half to go down to Canton, book the person in. This, the city of Sioux Falls, you're going to drive them north. And it's not, it's not, that's just human nature when you're, when you're working. So th this keeps law enforcement where law enforcement needs to be. A couple good things about this location would be the industrial park. We get a lot, there's a lot of burglaries in there. So you're going to have increased, you know, when a Sioux Falls police officer arrests someone, they've got to bring that person down to the Lincoln County Jail. No matter where we build it, they have to bring a Lincoln County inmate to the Lincoln County Jail, just like every other county that has a jail, which obviously we currently don't have. So we're, we're trying to keep the law enforcement most efficient, and that's why I recommended the northern end of the county. So I'm not as, I don't think anyone here is set on that location, but I do believe it should be in the northern 10 miles from 57th Street 
And then, you know, there's all sorts of suggestions out there, but to get water and sewer to some of those places would just not be feasible. And then there was one other comment that was made that I want to clarify, and this is, this is my understanding of it, so I might be asking more of a question than giving an answer. Currently, we budget $2.1 million or $2.059 million for jail operations. That is the money we pay Minnehaha County in rent and the, the fuel that we use to transport and medical costs. That's what we currently budget. So my understanding is you build the facility with the $68 per $250,000 house. So that is, the, that is your tax increase. The $2 million that we currently have in the budget would be used to operate this facility. So we're not asking for another $5 million. It, it will be a little bit more, but it will control a huge increase over years. So $2 million is already there. We're spending that in Minneapolis County. The $68 is your, your increase in your taxes to pay for the facility. I just wanted to clarify that. I do want to thank everyone for being so good about with the COVID situation we've got. I appreciate everyone being willing to spread about and wear their masks. I do want to say that that is um, something that I do appreciate from the audience. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Or is the commission willing to look at different sites? The concern that I have is where the site is going is it's within a half mile of a housing development with a lot of small kids and families too and there's a lot of people in that neighborhood who are very upset about that being going in thank you I, and again i that was a consideration um i do know that the site that is canton that has been proposed by some there are residential houses around there as well um in close proximity i think everyone believes they don't want to have this in their in their they want to have it possibly but definitely not in their back door so where do you place it? In, in the middle of nowhere where you don't have um, services? What I would say that it'd probably be better to put it in a place where it would have less impact on residential I, I don't, if we could find a spot like that, it, would, it was not presented as an option at this point. So that was feasible. Thank you though. We had another gentleman that was coming up. Oh yeah, thank you, sir. All right, thanks. Um, Mark Blow from Harrisburg. Um, wanna thank you for being forward looking. It's good to look at the problems that are coming in the future. Um, these decisions are never easy. Putting something like this anywhere gets people up in arms. You gotta have utilities. You can't be five miles out in the country. Um, the land price isn't that bad. I mean, anything, if you're gonna have 15 acres somewhere, Raw development land price is fifty to sixty thousand an acre. You're taught you're going to spend eight hundred to a million dollars anywhere you go. So tough decision. If you're living beside it, it's not a good thing. Probably, I'm not going to get into that. But I like to plan for the worst and hope for the best. Right now, we know we have a two million dollar a year problem. Had we done this three years ago we would have a $5 million solution to a $2 million problem in the short term. Long term, 30 years, it's a good thing. It isn't that huge of an issue in the next year or two because this isn't the only public safety problem we have in Lincoln County. Uh, the Lincoln County just got done with the master transportation plan. And we have some serious road problems up here that are an equal public safety problem as this jail is. We have county roads that carry more traffic than 95% of the state highways in South Dakota. Those things need to be addressed. And I know with uh, Harrisburg, right now they have, there's like 2,000 lots that are currently in the developing stages. And right now in the front of the Harrisburg High School, we had as much traffic as there was on 115 at the south border of Salem, Sioux Falls, before they redid 115. So you can see that facility the state built for that level of traffic. 
We really need those things on 106, 110, Cliff, Minnesota, Western, tall grass. There's 30 miles of road that need to be done. Another huge expenditure that uh, is an immediate need also. So there's a lot of costs coming to the county here. It's not just the jail. Uh, it's going to be a tough thing to solve. But uh, I think you are, do have some time. It isn't the end of the world if we don't do this this year. Uh, it's going to have to be addressed, and that's my two cents worth. So. Thank you. Is everyone comfortable? I, I just want to ask the audience, is, are they too hot, too cold? It originally was originally very warm. We're cold? Okay. John, fans off and maybe hit the heaters on. Sorry, folks. It's a little hot up here, so we didn't notice. <laughs> Uh, my name is Pam Howe. I live on Rose Circle. I live a quarter of a mile from this proposed site. Obviously, I'm not happy about it. And I wondered why, as being so close, we were never even notified that this was happening until three weeks ago. I heard about it from one of my neighbors. It's like you didn't want, to let, you didn't want anybody to know. You were hoping to slide this through without telling the people that affected the most. What I can tell you that it was in negotiations for quite a period of time and the individual that was offering the land requested that it uh, be private until it had been finalized. Uh, so it was not public, allowed for public knowledge until it was. But it affected the public. I so do understand that. And the, but that is also why that we have these public hearings and we do have a vote. But after the fact, you've already bought the land. Again, I'm gonna go back to the fact, even if we weren't looking at a public safety center, I am going to tell you that we needed to acquire this property for the purpose of, of controlling the potential for improvement in Nine Mile Creek drainage basin. And if you've lived there long enough, you understand how severe... <laughs> I've lived there for 41 years. 41 I know years. about all the drainage problems that nobody ever nobody wants to Nobody has care ever of. done anything no. about. And everybody and I, says it's another study, you know, well, and nothing ever happens. Well, I will tell you that we have an inv a vested in, uh, investment into this now, and we, I hope that the commissions that will sit in here, because this won't happen probably in, in a two-year term or a four-year term or a six-year term. Or probably not my lifetime. I it may not be. I'm not going to tell you when it does, because it's, it's going to be require funding to make those improvements. But if we didn't make the investment and get it out of the uh, uh, developer's hands, who could have developed substantially more than what we're proposing, uh, and made a much even drastic uh, effect onto that Nine Mile Creek Basin. Uh, I think what was potential to be there was considerably worse than what, what we're presenting, so. And another question I have as far as like, um, the sheriff had indicated that when you're transporting um, prisoners, that that's where the majority of your problems can happen. When you have the jail here and there's a courthouse in Canton, Obviously, you have a lot of transporting costs, which have you figured that in? Because obviously, there's a lot more expenses there. And there's a, more of an increase of chance of, you know, like what happened a few weeks ago at the interstate. Um, for clarification, the, the purposes of having the courtroom added to this is to avoid the transportation. So what type of court um, cases are going to be held there then? Those that require not to allow the individual get transported for safety purposes. Now, if it's somebody that has a drug offense, only a drug offense, and they're going to go see a judge. They're going to go into a courtroom down in, in Canton. So this you will is have additional costs transporting these people. We won't be transporting those. Those are not going to be in, people that are detained for long periods of time in our court courtroom. If they're still in our facility, they're already going to have gone through the court system, or they're going to be using that courtroom adjacent to the property or to the facility. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Wicker, Mayor of Hudson. Some of my questions are directed toward the sheriff. If he can come down or... <laughs> With 
with this proposed new facility, whether it's in T or, or wherever, it's obvious you guys want it in the north part of the county. Does that get include the new sheriff's offices in this facility, wherever it's at? Is this going to be where the sheriff's offices are going to be at? Yes. The, there, there will be deputies there. Uh, the jail uh, command staff would be there. My office would be in Canton. Okay. A year ago, after you were, elect, you were elected, I invited you down to Hudson to sit down and talk about law enforcement in Hudson. I'm still waiting yet. And are you the mayor? I am. Well, I've talked to you a dozen times on the phone about it. No, you haven't. Okay. I'd ask you. Well, then there's an impersonator. I've asked you about contracting with the sheriff's department. I've yet to come up with any figures, numbers, or have an actual face-to-face -face meeting with you, which is all fine. Yep. I can live with that. But if this facility is moved to the north part of the county, and 90% of the time that's where law enforcement would be, what is your plans to cover the south part of the county, which you don't do now very well? I'm, I'm working with a limited staff. We're working on in, improving that. The commission's been very, very uh, accommodating to getting us the staff we need. But we are, uh, most of the summer, we pro patrol the county with six deputies, six. That's uh, 597 square miles, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We transport mental health patients. We transport inmates. We uh, patrol Harrisburg through a contract. We, I mean, we're, we are literally doing, busting at the seams trying to keep, keep people moving. Two, we have officers that have over 200 hours of overtime this year covering shifts. I understand that, but what am I supposed to tell my citizens when they call me well, with currently, a complaint currently, and I tell them to call the sheriff's department? And I get told it's an hour wait, it's a waste of my time. I'm I, sorry. Okay, I appreciate, I, I need to keep everyone a little bit under control. You, I I'm think the control. two of you, I think you have, can talk to you, each other outside. I don't know if everyone needs, wants to hear this. My, my question would be, if this is, move to the north part of the county, what is the plan to cover the south part of the county? Just for clarification, we already have our facility in Sioux Falls. Are you talking strictly about the deputies that will be housed there? The deputies that would cover the southern part of Lincoln we're County. We're still going to have an, the office in Canton as well. There's going to be services in uh, this facility, but there'll still be services in Canton as well. We have to. It's not sounding like that. I'm sorry, but that doesn't sound like that. But ultimately, it's a matter of being on the road and, and having the ability to have more deputies is the objective. It sounds like the whole thing is geared towards getting everything in the north part of the county. I, That's I, what it sounds like. Well, I, I can understand why you think that and believe that, uh, but I can tell you that we already have, we're outside of our county housing our, our prisoners, and we're having our deputies bring them up into outside of our county, and they're spending time outside of our county. We're trying to bring them back into the county. Guess you don't sit where I sit, I guess. I, I, <laughs> all right, uh, if we can, Jermaine, to the topic, please. I just want to say it's a pretty building and all, but having it right next to a school, when you've got people that are, have sex offenders and all types of other things, and there, I think it used to be a law that in, I don't know about this state, but others that uh, they can't be within 500 yards of a school or so. And uh, we aren't in Hong Kong. I mean, there, there's no room. Here, you've got how many million square acres in the county? I mean, the fact that maybe uh, you have to put in a few extra utilities or something, but usually the places that people build prison systems is 
away from the public, not right in the heart of the public because right now tea is expanding in that direction. And pretty soon you're gonna have it completely encompassed by homes and children and all that running around. So uh, it seems to me kind of, I know there's, he wants it in the northern part, well that's fine, but there's plenty of room in the northern part to not have it next to a school or right in the middle of a housing project. And uh, I think if not many people really realize that this thing is on the ballot and what it means and where it's supposed to be. And uh, it would be nice if we could get a Facebook address where we could put all of our coordinate our thing. What we have here is kind of a divide and conquer. You know, we come here, we talk I, to... I, the, I think uh, you're going to get contacted very soon about the, the that yeah. aspect. Of it. If I may, are, are you finished? I'd like to address the question. Go ahead. So, so again, is it a perfect location? Absolutely not. I'm not going to try to tell you that. I do believe it makes a lot of sense. In one point I am going to make, by, but being very careful, we have an industrial area um, that is hit by theft constantly. I encourage you to investigate the South Dakota and the National Sex Offender Registry. You take a look at that area and investigate that area. There are three in the area. So when you talk about, yeah. You have young kids and I, so let me, okay, if I, if I can, so the alternative was county didn't buy the land. Some other developer comes in there and develops that. I'm going to tell you that of that low area, half of that could have been filled in if they chose to. There would not be much that could have stopped that. We don't have control over that. It's inside the city limits of T. No, that is. I'm saying other commercial areas. I'm a legal inspector. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Why are you defining authority that allows me to go on First Amendment and developing property without the proper reasons to Well, we have engineers that tell us it does. I, so what I'm trying to tell you, we're trying to improve something that has been messed up. I'm not going to argue there haven't been many mistakes on drainage. Well, this is hopefully a step to go in the right direction once. It's not going to be a quick fix, but if we keep it from being heavily developed, that will prevent that impact that way. That's, that's one of the issues. So when we go back to ruining the area, it is, a, it is a, not exactly, I hate to tell the people that are around, it's not a, there is a, it isn't a picturesque little area. There's some issues out there. I'm not saying this is going to solve it, but I tell you what, I, I think someone's going to think twice if they see a police car coming back and forth a little more regular. I don't know about race cars. Uh, yeah. So there, I mean, I'm not going to tell you that the pros for sure outweigh the cons, but there are some pros to having this next year too. How, I, 
I appreciate the comment. You know, we, yeah. I own a lot of property and I'm hoping to build very soon. The only reason I'm not building is the, are those that are in construction. Um, the, the building material costs have gone through the roof. Okay, folks. I have a, it's, anyway. Can we, all right, thank you for your comment. Next question, thank you. Troy Stenga with uh, in Harrisburg. Hey, I do have to commend you for buying the land, by the way. Uh, it does, it's a big step for Nine Mile Creek. I'm gonna be honest and tell you guys, I don't care what anybody else says, if you did not buy that land, it was filled in. It was gonna be done. If it wasn't Hart, it wasn't Lemmy, it was gonna be somebody else. And as everybody knows, I, I, I know just how house property is, how much water goes inside your building out there. I understand that. That's all the time. And it doesn't matter. I understand that. Nine Mile Creek is a big issue. This is one step closer to Nine Mile. It's got a long ways to go. If this project goes, trust me, engineering is going to have to be part of that project, and it's going to be nine miles going to be put into that project. If it goes, that's a big if. Because of the fact that it's on Nine Mile Creek, drainage that comes off there, you're going to have to retain that. But that's going to be part of the project. So that number that's up there is actually skewed. Even though it's not actually designed yet, engineering has not been done. That number is a false number. Being in this industry for over 20 years, that's a false number right now. That's a hopeful number. No bids have been out there yet, because nothing's been designed. Cost of materials are going up, as you know, just like you said. I watch that every day. Go buy a piece of plywood right now. <laughs> it's about tripled in price. Yep. So. When you look at these numbers, you can't look at these numbers. And they that could bond, be worse, and a year from now could they be, could be even worse. That bond could be double. Yeah. That bond could be do you, five million less. Mr. Stanga, do you think that the costs associated with improving Nine Mile Creek should be put on the, the back of the public safety? Or are they, are they, and I am just asking how he feels on that. Are they two different entities? On this set of property, it would not be two Senate entities because that, this property is kind of part of Nine Mile. But should it be sense. allocated as an expense in your mind as? It should be exp as an expense because this building so is then going how to, do have we, to have some. How do we approach trying to make the improvements by itself to Nine Mile Creek if we didn't do the? This, what I'm saying is on the property itself, you're going to have to do some retention and detention area. But with that, you have to determine, when you do your engineering, what's coming from up, what's going down below. Mm -hmm. That evaluates everything that comes through and what you're impacting, what you're making an impact. That impact then has to correlate with what Absolutely. you need to do the they, site. There are some uh, considerations that still have correct. to be determined. There's no doubt on that. Correct, correct. So. Hey, Mike, if, if, if I could add to that, um, this number, you're right, because we don't know everything there is that, that we're going to find uh, when, when we do our design. To, to handle that, we do have lots of contingency built, both construction contingencies, design contingencies, and owner contingencies in there to help uh, as a placeholder uh, to, to accommodate uh, for those sorts of things. Now, when, when, when we do these dollars per square foot numbers, we do that historically off old, well, past projects, one of which we just opened bids about a month ago. Um, and all of those projects include um, stormwater detention, retention, or I'm sorry, detention and retentage, um, um, uh, and new utilities. So I understand what you're saying, but that number actually does take an old, account of a lot of those, um, not only factors, but, but contingencies. In, but in this area, in the yes. state of South Dakota. Yes. It's at, where is that say South Dakota that you actually had this just done? So, so I understand. So, so what we did is, is we studied um, historical data on cost per, per jails, hired a professional cost estimator to tell us how, do, how does the cost of jails in certain parts of the area compare? 
And, and that's how we arrived. That, that information helped us arrive to this number. So that's really not a true number yet because bids haven't been out and hasn't been Oh, designed. no, of course not. I mean, the, the Correct. design's so that's, not that's what right. I want to say. Since it's not been designed, it has not been done. It is, this number is not a it's, real it's number It's a preliminary yet. cost It estimate. is not a real number. Correct. Thank it's you. Not it's not the final number. That's what I want to say. It's not the final number. Correct. That's yeah. what I want to say is it's not a real number right now. You can, and, and, put, you can go for a bond without a real number. And Does that make folks, sense? right or wrong, one of the reasons why we did place a $50 million on it was to make sure that if there were scenarios, because how we arrived, if I may quickly, because I am going to allow for two more questions if we have, because it, it's 9 o'clock and I do want people to, to get a chance, but I, I do need to wrap it up, unfortunately, is we consulted multiple professionals per se and the numbers initially were considerably higher than what we've were being presented with right now um, but they were too were just shooting it they wanted to make sure that they were covered and a lot of that also had to do with initially we were possibly looking at land in city the city of Sioux Falls which was not 1 million not 1.4 million it was four possibly five million dollars I mean that was a substantial change to what we're looking at um, so we needed to make sure that we had enough because the last thing you wanted to do is when you're getting into the project and you don't have the money to do it right. And um, we're hopeful that uh, these numbers are accurate, but yes, they are, are projections until we go to bid. If we go to bid, that's all they are. Okay. If I could, one more question just, for the evening. Or, just, just one more. All right. So did you, did you guys as, as a commission ever think about uh, our biggest talents, T in Harrisburg, actually going in there and correcting them with them to build an actual jail within the town instead of actually building one facility that's going to cost this much to actually build a couple different pods to actually house some inmates. But that would be close to Sioux Falls. It would be a destination. It would be half the price. You would not have to foot the full bill. They would have to put some of the bill in there. It's, it's an actually accessibility for the whole county, plus the towns. I, I can't speak for Harrisburg. We do the you know, policing in that already. So in essence, we're providing that service. I can tell you, not maybe authorized, I spoke with the city of T. I was indicated to me, not by the direction of the board, I just, would they have any interest in, in doing a joint venture? They had indicated no. Okay. Well, and it, it, I know they got their own town cops they should have a town jail. Right. So Correct? They, they're, and I think, in the process of building their own police station as, uh, as well. And that's so. what I'm saying, is that they so should, it was, it they was should be... So it was slightly pursued, but it was quickly indicated that wasn't an issue. Is there one more question? Okay. And I do... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mike, this, I'm, I'm Scott Oshnabot on Castle Del Rosa, all right, T here. Uh, my question is, a gentleman asked here a little while ago, what's the balance on this building, the courthouse, and the county shop right now? Madam Auditor, do you have the debt in, in we have a couple years left on the uh, addition at the courthouse. We're relatively new on the highway shop. Oh, does he know? Mr. Grimman, he doesn't have it. Sorry. I think she's looking it up. Technology is at her fingertips. Hopefully, Mr. Oshner, he can have that answer. While we're waiting for that, is there another question? Uh, Steph Holtrop, uh, 27290 Hemlock Avenue and T. Earlier, the sheriff had said we have a good six to 10 years to do this. And obviously, it showed up here. It's going to take time to get this approved. And obviously, like you said, nobody wants this in their backyard. Because in our backyard, we'll have this, we'll have the drainage, we have schools, and our homeowner values are all going down. We were never notified until a couple weeks ago. If we have six to 10 years, why are we having to rush this? We can't take six months, another year, to find a spot of land? I'm just saying, I'm, I'm just saying, like, there is spots, there are more spots, there is other places we don't need to rush this, especially for people who are about to could lose businesses, everything. It doesn't seem to make any sense. I think, and, and I don't know if you heard this when uh, the architect firm was speaking, 
but on average, this is going to cost an additional $100,000 every month that we keep delaying it. So over the course of one year, the cost is going to go up $1.2 million if what the architect is telling us is true. And we have no reason to believe that it is not true. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Regarding the design, um, this is all in the beginning stages. We don't know what the finishes are going to be like on the outside. This was to give the taxpayer and the voter something to look at to say, hey, this isn't going to be an ugly building. I, but I could care less what the building looks like personally. Like I'd rather have the gold chains knowing that they're not going to get in my children's backyard where my five-year-old little girl, as somebody else said, is going down the street to her friend's house, which I could no longer allow. That's not fair. I was never notified of it. We know nothing. And I just, what about my property values? You say that's going to increase 100000 a month. What about the decrease of my property values the longer that this gets built in my backyard? Or... Or furthermore, an expansion. Like, I'm permanently stuck in my property forever. So you're saying you want to buy my house, you're going to stay in my property forever? Or any of you, do any of you ever, are you going to be your backyards? Is this going to be any of your backyards? Are any of your children going to be at the T-School District that's within miles of this jail? Any of you? Okay, that's not fair. Okay, it's back to not in our backyard. Um, then, then you want us to propose to put it out in the, we propose to put on the ballot that we find a location or give us multiple locations, not say, here's this one that's in your backyard. You've given no notification to us, no nothing. I, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. But, and I, I get the line. I don't have their creek. I don't, I don't have their flood creek. And yeah. I'm thankful that you're addressing the drainage issues because we do. We have terrible drainage issues. And where you're going to build this, who knows? The drainage could shift our ways because we're just a little bit to the, we're in blue spruce, which is yep. a huge flood issue as well. So who's to say the way you shift it, it doesn't come more at us and help them? I, I can tell you that it wouldn't be allowed for us to not compensate somebody if we impacted negatively to the drainage. Um, it, it is. But, I, I'm talking about the drainage right now, if I could. Right, and I get that. That's, that's a great thing that you bought the land for that, but I don't think it's a great place to build the jail, who's ever backyard, and being right close to schools and all of that, that, I mean, children. We're talking harmless children. I, I, don't, I don't know how I can reassure you that this isn't going to be that as much of a detriment. I know it's a shock. We have spoken to many architects. We have talked to other jail facilities that are in residential areas. Um, it may be hard to believe, but the impact is not that negative. Of course, you're gonna have a, a real estate agent that will tell you what you wanna hear, but, if you want to, if you could show me where a house that sold prior to a project versus a, pro, a property that sold after the project, that's that's real evidence, and I have not had seen that real evidence. But the taxpayers can decide if this is the right spot or not. That's that's on the ballot. And I don't disagree. We we need a jail, but I'm just saying if we need this, this is great. But I think if we have time, we should look at other options and not. Well, we are not out of time, but time goes quickly. Great. Right, I'm not disagreeing, and COVID this year pandemic doesn't help us. Right. It's helped no one. But I also think having more public forums where we could talk land or people, other people's opinions other than you guys getting to decide that, especially when none of you would be directly impacted with this in your backyard or children or grandchildren at those schools. Good points. I'm not going to argue. Nice. Mr. Commissioner Gillespie. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. I'd like just to make a couple comments. Ma'am, I totally agree with you. Since February 18th, Commissioner Ahrens and myself have voted no on this for, most, for the most part. I thought it was too much, too fast. We've got a contract with Minneapolis County till October of 24, which most likely could be extended with proper talking. I started in Lincoln County in November of 1992 as a deputy sheriff. And I can honestly tell you, we had 10 to 15 people in custody in Minneapolis County. Today, 27 years later, we have 40 more people in custody. And a lot of it's because of electronic monitoring, 24-7. I mean, that's 27 years and 40 more people. 
this 191 bed facility that is proposed, you know, I don't think we're there yet. I look at this, this document here, and Chairman Poppins has it, I see a revenue of 2.7 million. That's federal inmates or U.S. Marshals inmates. I don't think we're going to see them kind of income. We're going to get some. Sheriff Swenson has said we're not guaranteed anything. We will probably get some, but not to that number probably. And then we're going to have to go back to you and ask for more money. Why my house could lose value no, or my no. children would be Rex. Anyway. Or, yeah. Anyway, that's, I'm going to give it up, yield that, but that's my two cents. And Thank I've you. been around here longer than anybody uh, as far as with the county, to my knowledge, outside of Bill Golden, maybe. But, Thank uh, you. Anyway, so. Um. I am uh, going to uh, ask for uh, Madam Auditor if she was able to come with those numbers, and then we will adjourn this, this meeting. We had a down payment, pretty substantial down payment, I believe, on this building, though, too. So, I do want to thank everyone. Um, there may be commissioners that want to linger. Um, I'm going to get back to my family. Uh, I want to thank uh, the commissioners and the presenters, uh, but I do need a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? second. Motion and second to adjourn. I kind of miss Sean, but uh, Commissioner Gillespie? Yes. Commissioner Aarons? Yes. Commissioner Lindeen? Yes. Commissioner Poppins? Yes. Thank you all. Yeah, 